everyone, and welcome to another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities on Our Own Devices. I'm Jean Messier, and today we are taking a look at a trio of reflector gun sights. Now, those of you who do any shooting will likely recognize this device. This is an open red dot sight, very popular among many shooters today. But this is merely the most recent incarnation of a technology that's been around for nearly 120 years. Now, the very first reflector gun sight was patented by Irish inventor Howard Grubb way back in the year 1900. But the technology really saw its greatest period of development during the Second World War when it was mostly used aboard fighter aircraft. And that's what these two sights are. This is a British Mark II and Mark III reflector gun sight. So the Mark II was made for use again aboard fighter aircraft, such as the Hawker Hurricane and Supermarine Spitfire. And you can tell because this is the remains of a big old rubber pad that was there to protect the pilot against bashing his head open against the site in case of a hard landing. The Mark III, on the other hand, was mostly used in defensive turrets on bombers and patrol aircraft or in twin engine aircraft that had forward firing guns such as the de Havilland Mosquito. Now, before I go into how these devices actually work, we need to understand the problem that they were intended to solve, and that's the problem of parallax. Now, simply put, parallax is the difference in angular shift between objects at varying distances. So, imagine you're driving along the highway in the countryside, the objects closest to you, like the side of the road, will appear to go by very quickly, whereas objects farther away will move far more slowly and objects very far away, essentially at infinity, like the sun and the moon, will appear not to move at all. And incidentally, if I may take a little bit of a detour, that is why moths and other nocturnal insects get trapped flying around streetlights and things like that. You see, they navigate by flying at right angles to the moon, and since the moon is very far away and suffers from practically no parallax, they're able to navigate just fine. But when they come across an artificial light and try to fly at right angles to that, well, if you're flying at right angles to a fixed point, you're going to end up going around in circles and getting stuck. So now you know. Now, parallax becomes something of a problem when you are trying to aim a firearm. So most firearms, like this Airsoft Webley revolver here, have what are known as iron sights. So you have a rear notch and a front post. And in order to properly aim the gun, you have to align your eye with the rear notch and then align the front post with the notch. And only when all three are properly aligned can you properly aim the gun. If you move the gun side to side or if you move your eye side to side, you're going to be aiming off target. Now, during the First World War, at the dawn of military aviation, fighter pilots had a very similar setup. Their machine guns were fitted with very simple ring and bead sights, which forced them to have to align their head with the sight in order to make a clear shot. As you can imagine, as a fighter pilot, that's not a very convenient thing to have to do. If you want to maintain situational awareness, you're going to have to be able to move your head around. You can't keep aligning your head with your sight. And that is the problem that reflector gun sights were designed to alleviate. And they did this through a process called collimation. So our eyes judge the size and distance of objects based on the angle of the light reflecting off of them. So for example, an object that's very close or very large will have light coming off of it at a much steeper angle than an object that is smaller or farther away. And an object that's at a very great distance, at essentially infinity, will have light coming off of it in beams that are essentially parallel and thus it will suffer from very little parallax, very little movement when you change your point of view. Now, if you'll recall from my video on the Fresnel lens, a convex lens will focus light to a point known as the focal point, the distance from that point to the center line of the lens being known as the focal length. This also works in reverse. If you place a light source at the focal length of the lens, the light coming out of the lens will be collimated, it will be bent into parallel beams. And this is the effect that a reflector gun sight takes advantage of. So if we take the example of the Mark III gun sight, inside the housing we have a light bulb and a little mask that turns the light into a ring and bead, basically a crosshair. Then we have a collimating lens inside the stem which takes that light and turns it into parallel rays of light. That collimated image 
then goes up into this beam splitter, this angled piece of glass. And most of that light will go straight through it, but some of it will be reflected back into the pilot's eyes. And what this does is it superimposes an image, a reticle, that is essentially at infinity over a clear view of the target area. And as you'll see in this footage that I filmed of this site in action, that means that no matter how the pilot moves his head, that reticle will not move. It will continue to be aligned with the aircraft's guns, meaning that the pilot can easily make a shot no matter where his head is positioned within the cockpit of the aircraft. So the first military reflector gun site for aircraft, the OIG site, first entered service with the German Air Force in 1918, the final year of the Great War. And a handful were mounted experimentally on fighter aircraft, such as the Fokker DR-1 and the Albatross D-5. But it really wouldn't be until the mid to late 1930s, leading into the Second World War, that reflector gun sites would become common on fighter aircraft. It's during this period that they underwent their greatest technological development. So you see, although a gun sight like this one makes it much easier to hit your target, hitting a moving target like another fighter aircraft is very difficult. So one of the key skills a fighter pilot has to learn in order to be successful and survive is deflection shooting or leading the target. That is, shooting ahead of the moving target so that it intersects with your rounds. This requires quite a bit of practice and finesse to get right, but thankfully, Calculating the appropriate offset actually requires only two key pieces of data, the rate of turn of the aircraft and the range to the target. So in 1940, the British started developing something called the gyro gun sight, which would automatically uh, calculate the correct deflection for the pilot. And how this worked was the gun sight was wired up to a gyroscope, much like the ones that would run most of the aircraft's flight instruments, and this would automatically give the rate of turn. Now, the pilot also had a little knob on the back that he could adjust based on the type of aircraft he was attacking, say a Junkers 88 or Heinkel 111 bomber or a Messerschmitt Bf 109 fighter. And then he had another little dial mounted on his throttle that allowed him to uh, increase or shrink the diameter of the reticle so that it just touched the wingtips of the aircraft he was pursuing. And that would automatically calculate the range to the target. The site would then automatically combine the data from that dial and from the gyro and project a second reticle offset by the amount of deflection the pilot needed, allowing him to make the shot. Now, this sounds good in principle, but the very first incarnation of this, which was called the Ferranti Mark I gyro gun sight, which entered service in 1941, uh, was not very well thought out because it had just this tiny little telescopic sight that the pilot had to press his face up against in order to make the shot, which you'll probably recognize is not ideal in a dogfight. So it was re-engineered and entered service in 1943 as the Ferranti Mark II gyro gun sight, which had a much more conventional reflector gun sight layout. This is incredibly successful and it served for the rest of the war and the United States even made its own copies in large numbers. Now, after the war in the 1950s, the gyro gun sight saw yet another period of development resulting in something called a radar gun sight. And here, instead of the pilot manually adjusting the range to his target, which as you can imagine is not a very convenient thing to do in the middle of a dogfight, these aircraft were equipped with a little ray dome in the nose, which would automatically give the range to the target and calculate the deflection. So as long as you could get a radar fix on your target, you could automatically calculate how much you had to lead it by. And reflector gun sights are still used in a sense to this day in what's known as a heads up display, where it's not only information from the missiles and the guns for the targeting systems displayed, but also all the key data from your flight instruments, meaning that the pilot can keep his head up, hence the name, and not have to look down at his instruments during a dogfight. So the idea of using this sort of heads up display in aircraft has in fact a very long history. So while reflector gun sights are mainly associated with aircraft during World War II, they also had other applications such as in anti-aircraft guns and mortars. Now the sights used in mortars were a little bit different in that they didn't actually have a clear beam splitter. You actually couldn't see through the sight, you just saw a reticle. And how you're supposed to use them is by keeping both eyes open so that your brain automatically superimposed the reticle over your view of the target. 
And the reason that they were built this way was just for simplicity and ruggedness, which are, you know, two qualities that are good to have with a mortar, which are going to be lugging around the battlefield and which might get dinged up and damaged. Now, what reflector sites weren't used on during the war were small arms like rifles, machine guns, and submachine guns. And there's two basic reasons for this, one being sheer bulk. Most gun sites of the era were of this vertical configuration, and this would have been just inconvenient to mount on a rifle. This is later alleviated by different changes in design, but we'll get to that in a second. The second reason has to do with illuminating the reticle. Gun sites like these used on aircraft, as well as those used on large artillery pieces, would have had access to a convenient power source to light the lamp. But at the time, the only compact light source available was a regular incandescent bulb, which is not very power efficient. And so it would have been impossible to create a gun sight compact enough to mount on a rifle that wouldn't have drained its batteries within a couple of hours. So the first commercially successful gun sights, including Howard Grubb's original 1900 patent and the later Weaver Quick Point from the 1970s, were solar powered. The quick point in particular had a fiber optic light pipe mounted on top of it with a little dome that would collect sunlight and channel it into the site to illuminate the reticle. This worked just fine, but as you can imagine, it only works under certain lighting conditions. You can't use them at night. And it wouldn't be until the 1980s with the development of the light emitting diode, the LED, which is very efficient in its power consumption, was it finally possible to create a compact gun sight that had a battery life that could last you know, several days or more. And so that technology really didn't start to become mainstream until the late 1980s, early 1990s. At the same time, innovations in gun sight design allowed them to be far more compact and lightweight than their World War II ancestors. So for example, if you take a look at this modern red dot sight, it's able to be so compact because the optic combines the functions of the collimating lens and the beam splitter. So this optic actually has a spherical concave rear surface that acts as a collimating mirror. So we have a little laser diode in the back here with a mass to create a reticle, and that's projected up into the rear surface of the optic where the light reflected off of the rear of the optic is collimated and turned into a parallel beam that goes back into the shooter's eye. And what's done using modern technology is that the rear of the optic is coated in what's known as a dichroic coating, which is a coating that only reflects a very specific wavelength or range of wavelengths of light. And if you can tune the laser to match the coating, then only that specific narrow band of wavelengths produced by the laser is going to be reflected back into your eye, and the optic will allow all other wavelengths, you know, everything from the target you're trying to shoot at, to pass through, giving you the clearest possible image. And so you have a very rugged, very effective little sight that consumes so little power that a little you know, button battery will last you for months. So there you have it, a brief history of reflector gun sights from 1900 all the way to the present day. I'd like to give a huge shout out to my friends Matt Heinz and Gord Crossley for being kind enough to provide these gun sights for this video. Thanks so much, guys. Uh, that's all I have for you today. Uh, we'll see you on another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities where we'll look at yet more fascinating artifacts just like these. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.